Hello and welcome to Off The Fence, brought to you in association with Bet365. This is, of course, your weekly rundown of all things jump racing. And as always, I am joined by Tony Keenan and Barry Geraghty. And as always on the show, we look back at the past seven days of jump racing in England and Ireland, and we look ahead, and we're only two weeks away from the Cheltenham Festival. So later on in the show, we're gonna be dissecting the anti-post markets of the Championship Novice Hurdle Races something to get stuck into there. But before we get there, and it's not a particularly nice topic to have to start the show on, but we are starting this week's show with our weekly offence section, because of course this week, what we have all taken offence to on this show, in the racing public and in the wider public, is this Gordon Elliott story with the picture emerging of uh, one of Irish, uh, Ireland's most prolific trainers sat aboard a dead horse on his gallop, seemingly. Um, the picture obviously started to do the rounds on social media over the weekend, and then it was released on Sunday and into today, Monday, that the picture was indeed real, and the Irish regulatory body are now looking into said picture into Gordon Elliott and investigating the situation. We are waiting for further details. Essentially, it is in fact indefensible. It's clearly a huge lapse of judgment on Gordon Elliott's part. And we have all, like I said, taken offense to this, but Tony Keenan, it's hard to know where to start in dissecting this mess. Um, of course, we're all offended by the picture what was your initial reaction when you saw the picture and what happens now? I suppose my initial reaction was disbelief. I wouldn't have been hoping it, it wasn't real, but sure, obviously uh, the, the truth has come to light in the, in the last couple of days. Um, I suppose I'm still getting my head around it. Um, not really sure what to think or if what I'm thinking is right about it. One thing I do uh, don't really want to see is a massive pile on, on Gordon Elliott. Um, that's not really edifying for anyone, but at the same time, I, I do kind of want to make me points on this um, that don't really reflect very well. And I suppose the kindest thing that I can say is, it was a very very stupid thing to do. Um, like this is a time, the timing's awful. This is the time when we should be running up to Cheltenham, leading into all that's good about the sport. Um, we're a fortnight out now, and we've just the sport is just going to get massive and masses of uh, negative PR between now and then. Um, it's absolutely wrong what he's done and to be honest his statement um, has made it worse I think almost everything seems to be able to agree on that um, this barely plausible idea that um, the horse was dead and he just had to take a phone call and absent-mindedly sat on the horse like, like, like who does that um, like, like that that just that that just was, was, was a was something he shouldn't he shouldn't have put out that statement that that, that just made the thing an awful lot worse um look to anyone looking in from the outside it looks like a posed photo it looks like you're messing with a dead animal and, and obviously everyone is kind of disgusted with that um look you have to be realistic about how racing yards operate um i'm not expecting horses to be given the full funeral rights or the work of a racing yard to stop when a horse dies like this is the, the, the pact that as racing fans you have to make. You have to be willing to acknowledge that horses are going to die in the sport. Um, and if you're not able to do that, it isn't the sport for you. But by God, you, you, you certainly don't expect the, the, the corpses to be treated with utter disrespect by, by the participants. Um, and you know, this is the thing I've been having for the last couple of days. How do you explain this to your non-racing fans, friends? The answer to that is you just can't. Um, it's absolutely impossible. And I'm almost avoiding people now, anyone bringing it up um, at this point. Look, Gordon Elliott is one of the most high-profile people in Irish race. And he's one of a handful of people who are actually known with their first name. You've Aidan, you've Willie, um, you've Ruby, you've probably Barry here, Rachel. That's probably the height of it. Five or six people. Um, and with that sort of position does come responsibility. Now, he's gotten a lot out of the sport um, in the sense of backing and success and all that type of stuff. But you also have to bear in mind that it's up to you to kind of maintain the integrity of the sport. And, you know, 
it'd be bad for an or it'd be horrendous for a smaller trainer to be doing this but it is all the worse for a for a massive name to, to, to do it and this is a trainer who like we were reasonably expecting to be coming in the chat and having four five six winners he trains the best known jumps horse around in tiger roll and probably the great the great hope of jump racing at the minute um envoy allen it's become total mainstream news like RTE Sport were leading on it on the, on the radio this morning. Um, I believe even Joe Duffy Show was covering it today. Just for, for the UK listeners, the Joe Duffy Show is a, an afternoon radio show on, on RTE um, Radio 1. It's a phone-in show. Like, they're just liable to be talking about absolutely anything. But th that's what they were talking about today. So like, th th obviously that was all negative. Um, and people, rightly or wrongly, are getting the impression that, you know, that horses are just disposable in racing at the minute. Um, and... They'd be rightly asking the question, like, is this kind of the culture in the yard? And could you blame blame them for that? Like, I'm actually ashamed to be a fan of the sport today. I've never said that in my life, like, but that, that's how I'm feeling at the minute. Like, horrendous errors of judgment and such a point where you'd have to question like, his kind of judgment overall. But the number one thing it does come back to is, like, racing exists by, by a social contract. Like, people who maybe aren't interested in racing are quite happy to let racing carry on on the proviso that... Um, while, again, horses may die in the pursuit of the sport, that they are being looked after in every other um, aspect of their, their daily lives and stuff like that, that they're really being cared for. And if racing doesn't have that, like, really we're in bother. And this is what, I think this is going to be the, the battle that, that racing's going to be fighting over the next few weeks as the, as the mainstream media um, get their teeth into this. Yeah, I mean, Barry, from your point of view, uh, obviously... You close, you know, you know the yard well. Um, what was your initial reaction? Uh, same question, really. What was your initial reaction when you saw the photo? What's your stance on it now? And where do we go from here? Because I think moving forwards now, ahead of two of the biggest festivals of the year, actually the biggest festivals of the year, the Cheltenham Festival, and then of course on to Aintree, we have to try and find a way to move forward from this. But what are the answers there? Well, it's not easy, um, you know, to see the see the photo itself. It was disgusting and disturbing, and was hard to believe. Um, and it's the industry didn't need it. Um, it's not a true reflection on the care that goes into these horses. You know, all the staff, owners, trainers, everyone, every yard. I've ridden out in so many yards in England and in Ireland, and it's the same. Horses are cared for. They look so well. Every hour of the day, they're minded. They're kept. They're fed. They're groomed all the way through to retirement. Um, you know, we've, we've a horse here at home. He's 18 year old. He ran three times. He was no good. And he's here. The kids ride him, have fun with him and play with him. Horses have a future after racing. You know, it's not a callous sport. Um, you know, and like any other field sport, you're going to have injuries. But, you know, this doesn't reflect well. And but it's not a true reflection on the love and care that's shown in every yard, the length and breadth of England and Ireland by everyone involved in racing. And it's, it, it's a, it's a tough blow for racing and it's, it is sad. And just f for Gordon himself, uh, obviously this Barry was just a, a huge moment of misjudgment. I mean, you know Gordon. Um, a moment of pure stupidity, which surely he now looks back on with huge regret. Yeah, well, that's what it must have been. Um, I haven't spoke to him about it, but yeah, a moment of, of, of stupidity. And I'm sure he looks back and he'll, he'll, it'll, for years to come, it'll be obviously a defining moment for him. And it's the implications it can have on his career. We don't know how it's going to go. Um, you know, he's got so many super horses there and a, a brilliant string of horses who are all well cared for like, like everyone else's. Um, but it's, it's, it's just hard to believe and it's, it's, it's going to take a while before it goes away. A very long time indeed it's just one of those things that you just know from now on every time if Gordon has a winner let alone at this Cheltenham festival but in Cheltenham festivals for years to come if he trains a Grand National winner again this photo will be everywhere for years and Tony in terms of the near future building up to Cheltenham obviously the BHA have now come out and said that whilst the Irish investigation is going on Gordon Elliott can no longer have runners here in the UK uh, we don't know when the outcome of the Irish investigation will be brought into the public domain. But it, as Barry said, and as you said, Tony, it's just such a mess ahead of the biggest week of the year. What do you think for the industry is a best case scenario at this stage now? Oh, I'd have, I'd have absolutely no idea. Um, I, 
like if something like this, I don't know, had happened in December or January, would they be able to give it more time? But the BHA really, to me, are after for, forcing the IHRB's hand here with this. They're going to have to um, expedite the process and, and get this done very quickly. Like They've never dealt with anything like this this before. I, I'm, things like this may have happened in other sports where there's been something very unsavoury on um, social media. I, I'm not really sure how they've dealt with it, but I was looking through the real, the rule book. Like, this is totally novel to me. Um, like, the closest thing I could find, like, there's no, I suppose the, the one that would spring to mind maybe in other sports is bringing the sport I- into disrepute. There's no such phrase in the IHRB r- uh, rule book. There is one there, rule 272, part one, where they talk about conduct and behaviour prejudicial to the good reputation of horse racing. And that would be the closest that I could see where this this um, this situation would apply, but there's no sanction. It, it's just a vague thing there, where uh, an unspecified sanction. So what, uh, like uh, to me, anything and everything um, is in play here. Um, but yeah, I, I, as both of you've said, that it is kind of the legacy uh, as much as anything else. Like, like this is going to be the thing that's going to going to hang over Gordon Elliott now, nearly no matter what he does. It, it's very hard. It's a long, long road to redemption, shall we say? Um, a, after something like this, whatever the the immediate um, whatever the immediate decision of, of the IHRB is. Yeah, we will await the results of the investigation. Barry, just last thing I wanted to ask you on the topic. Um, in terms of the horses that Gordon has going to the Cheltenham Festival, obviously some seriously uh, high-profile horses, Envoy Allen, the headline act of his team. If, and it is a big if, because we absolutely have no idea at this stage uh, what will happen with horses, but if they weren't able to run in his name and they potentially went to other trainers, how much does that affect a horse in your experience? Just as a sort of uh, left field question, how how much is that going to be an issue for these top class horses or not an issue at all? It depends on the individual. Um, some would react differently to others. Uh, the younger they are, they're probably more vulnerable to it. They would be to that. Um, your juveniles mightn't settle in as well. Now, an older horse can be the same, but an older horse can be more relaxed and he can move yards like they do by going to Cheltenham itself. They're there a few days before they run. So some horses settle in better than others. So it'll, it's a it's a wait and see and, and wait to see what happens or horses go where or horses go nowhere. I, I don't know. So it's, it's, it's all, everything is up in the air. You have hit the nail on the head, boys. Everything is up in the air. It's a terrible, terrible mess. It's a shame for the sport as a whole. I'm with you, Tony. I'm embarrassed at this point uh, to be involved in the sport. It's hard to even start to talk to wider racing, uh, anyone with a wider racing interest in the public about how this has happened, why it's happened, and it is completely indefensible. So hopefully now uh, we will get an answer or, you know, the Irish investigation uh, will happen swiftly. I think that's all we can hope for at this stage. Viewers, what did you make of this Gordon Elliott situation? What was your thoughts on the picture? What do you think should happen now? We do want to hear from you as always, but we do want to hear from you on this uh, very tricky issue tricky topic but please do get in contact on twitter in the comments box on youtube as always and of course on facebook our team behind the scenes look at all of the comments and we want to hear from you so do get involved i think we can probably move on now thank goodness uh let's move on and look back at the last seven days of jump racing in the uk and ireland and we're gonna head over to, well, we're gonna cover Tritonic, impressive in the Adonis hurdle, and is now nine to four favorite, I think, for the triumph with bet 365. Barry, what did you make of Tritonic's performance? And we have covered it well on the shows in the previous weeks that there is a very strong Irish team in the triumph hurdle this year, but Tritonic, I'm siding with him. I I couldn't have been more impressed. I thought he showed the real toolkit you're going to need for a triumph hurdle. But from your point of view, would you agree with that statement? Well, it looks like the betting public are siding with him too because he he seems to have gone favourite just ahead of Zana here. So um, you'd have to be impressed. He travelled brilliantly, settled nice. He dropped in early to get him relaxed. He jumped his way into a nice position down the back straight. He was always travelling easy. Adrian had to give him a little squeeze before the third last to get into position. 
Um, but he was quick and slick and measured for a horse only having a second run. Alan King does brilliantly with his juveniles and has done over the years. Um, but for me, it was the distance he put between himself and the field from the last of the line that really impressed. Um, and he hit the line full of running. So, no, I think he's a big contender and it's no surprise to see him go to the head of the market. But I think it is a very strong triumph. Um, it looked rock solid and he was 105 rated on the flat, raced over a mile and a half. Um, in Newmarket, one of his last runs off that rating. So he's got a high level of form. He stays well. He jumps well. He has size. He's scope. He's experienced from the flat too. So he's not going to... The hustle and bustle of Cheltenham isn't going to affect him so much. So, no, he's definitely an exciting horse for that race. And time to get off the fence, I'm afraid, Barry. If you were with... If you if I gave you the option of Tritonic or Team Ireland in the Triumph, which way would you go at this point? Well, I'd have to stick with me first loves on here. Um but he's he's definitely he's a he's a he's a worthy opponent. It's the he's a he is the main one, there's no doubt. He's the one that Zan here has to beat and it'll be a brilliant match. Okay. Tony, would you agree with that statement from Barry? I would, yeah, I know I'd still I think Zana here uh, should be favoured most likely winner at this point. Viewers what did you think of Tritonic at the weekend? Uh, do you believe that he should be ahead of all the Irish challengers in the Triumph Hurdle market? Currently favourite with Bet365. Do you think he's at the right price at currently 9-4 to four top of the market with Bet365? As always, please do get involved. Uh, Tony, let's stick with you because Cape Tribula uh, Cape Gentleman, sorry, the Dovecut winner, mm. uh, brought over from Ireland by Emmett Mullins. Didn't look the winner the whole way through the race, but got the job done in the end and some very savvy placing from Emmett. Yeah, she showed a very good attitude um, uh, just after the last. Um, but the thing I, I, I suppose it twigged with me is, again, Emmett Mullins, is, he's very creative at, at placing his horses. Um, I suppose if you've got a good horse in Ireland and you're coming up against the big two or three yards, you sometimes can be in a hiding to nothing. You could run a career your best all the time and be finishing toward a four. But he tends to think a little bit outside the box and does some some weird plays. And I was just finding some, well, this was one example, but there, there are numerous examples. He, he ran a horse there over in the, I think it's the American Grand National Hurdle, they call it, Tornado Watch a few years back. Um, Jury Duty actually won the race and this horse finished second. Got, six, got the equivalent of sixty thousand pounds for finishing second. He was on his next start in Ireland. He was rated one hundred and twenty-three. Amazing stuff, really. That that's, that was very good. Another one was uh, Fujimoto Flyer. He ran it in France. Uh, I think it was a juvenile hurdler last season. Won a lovely race in France for thirty-two thousand. So just to uh, spot maybe maybe unusual races that wouldn't be obvious um, and would avoid some of the the the, the, the big yards. And I, th I believe as well the shunter who's prominent in some of those um Cheltenham anti post handicap markets. He's actually going to the Moor Battle Hurdle, um, which would kinda of look a, look an ideal race for him. I think he referenced that in the Irish field this week, an eighteen furlong race because I don't know if there is a perfect race for him at Cheltenham. Uh, two can be looks a little bit sharp for him if the, you're going to have spring ground um, and he mightn't be high enough maybe to get into some of the, the races over further. But yeah, I just I just think that's worth recognising that the way he does place the horses spot maybe some less obvious races. Savvy individual indeed, and he is currently 25 to 1 with Bet365 for the Ballymore hurdle. Uh, Tony, let's stick with you and head over to Fairy House. Jason the Militant giving way to uh, get it a uh, giving way to way, sorry, to Petit Mouchoir and an impressive performance in the end, pulling well clear of the rest. Yeah, I thought this was a really good performance. He was off a break, hadn't run since the Moral Guiana Hurdle, had a chunky penalty. Um, his times seems to be excellent. I, I timed oh, the hurdle races there from the first to the line. He's nine seconds faster than anything else on the card, which which is really impressive sort of stuff. Thought his hurdling was super slick. Um, you know, real champion hurdle type hurdling type stuff. Look, he he was the best horse. You were on, on the run on the card. You expect him to be running a good time. But I thought it was a borderline one sixty type performance. I mean, there aren't all that many one sixty horses about. I think there's uh, in the two mile hurdling division. I think there's two in the UK and maybe three in Ireland. So. You know, he goes there with a chance if he got a little bit of soft ground. Um, you know, maybe I think the trainer said that he, he may possibly want um a flatter track. But this this was very promising. He's improving at the right time. He's got a nice mix of speed and stamina. He's won a flat maiden uh, not so long ago. Uh, not the not the worst outsider I'd say in the champion hurdle. Like it, not offended by him at all. I like that a lot. He is currently thirty three to one with bet three six five for the champion hurdle. And Tony, um, the other. Grade three winner on the card, whose name I... <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, <laughs> I get I'm nervous going, about I, saying these things. I get nervous, okay? So I'm just bailing out a saying You're, you're all right. 
I'm going, I'm going to go to Hipu, I think is the name of this one. Apparently it's named after some famous waves that you have in Hawaii for surfing. I think that's the right place anyway. So, um, yeah, he didn't really create too many waves probably in the three and four of the market. Shortened up a little bit. Um, uh, again, I thought it was a, quite an improved performance ba based on his first run um, where he was coming down with, with Umdor. The last Umdor looked to be going a little bit better than him, but he, he finished out the race very well that day, and again he finished out well on um, Saturday. He looks a real staying type of juvenile holder. Three and four would probably suit him. I uh, don't think Gordon Elliott was just all that keen on going for. He mentioned maybe coming back for Easter, um, the Easter race. But yeah, I thought also he jumped better. So experience wasn't lost. In him. He'd be an interesting horse to keep on saying. He looks like a horse already that will have no problem getting two and a half in time, maybe even a little bit further. Positive mentions from Tony about both those two winners from uh, the Ferry House card. And Barry, over to you for Kalos Emery who are back to winning ways, and you've shrewdly already tipped him up on the show at 50-1 to 1 for a champion chase. So, you know, all credit to you this week. Well, I think Willie Mullins <laughs> might deserve a little bit of credit as well. Um, it was a good performance, though. He, he seemed to jump much better than he did in Clamelli, travelled brilliantly, and he gave £9 to, to Daily Tiger, who was rated 157 after winning a competitive Ferrius handicap. So he's, I think he's, he's bang there, although Willie hasn't committed to going to... Uh, Cheltenham he's, he says there is options for him at home as well but um, Shaka and Pursoir was a non-runner there last year and I'm sure if Shaka and Pursoir for some reason didn't turn up in Cheltenham this year well he might be a little bit scorned if he leaves this one at home so positive mentions for lots of the winners on the well three of the winners on the Ferry House card that wraps up a look back at the last seven days in England and Ireland but let's look forward now because of course Cheltenham Festival just around the corner and let's focus on the positive uh the we've we've already done the championship races in terms of looking at the anti-post markets in the last three shows last four shows so take a look back if you want our views in terms of anti-post prices there but now we're going to look ahead to the grade one novice hurdle events uh, we thought that might be of more interest considering there are some red hot favorites for the grade one novice chase events so we're going to get stuck into the grade one novice hurdles and obviously we're going to start with the supreme and currently appreciate it is the seven to four favorite with bet 365 for the supreme hurdle barry garrity uh, a race everyone wants to win kicks off the week in fine form for whichever team lands the spoils. Where are you going in this race? Do you want to take appreciated on? It sort of seems to, he, he's a horse who seems to divide opinion, I'm finding. Yeah, well, it's it's difficult to go against Willie Mullins. He's a great record in the race. He's won it umpteen times. Um, he was first champion winner about 30 years ago with tourist attraction in it. Um, but I think appreciated, I think he lead it soft to be at his best. Um, he, to me he looks like a horse who love a trip and he love a trip and a fence in time so I think if, if it is if it does dry and um, we've had a nice dry week and if it, if it's a dry run to Cheltenham they will water the ground obviously but if they're watering drying ground it's going to be it's going to be good to soft at worst and I think he's going to need it slower than that and I, I would look at the pace options I thought Bally Adam travelled up really well behind and um, appreciated in, in Leopardstown and he missed the last the last time but yet he finished off reasonably well on, on very soft ground. So I think Bally Adam of better ground is a threat. Um, I was also impressed at Soaring Glory in Newbury in the Betfair Hurdle. I thought it was a good performance, travelled really well. He was only rated 133 um, and he's gone 140 plus now. But I think he'd have won it off 140. Um, he was well handicapped in a couple of disappointing runs. But he's a horse who's got a lot of pace and you need a lot of pace on the on the old course in Cheltenham. Downhill run over the third last, second last you're flat to the boards at that point. You need a fellow who's sitting in fourth gear, not fifth gear, and able to quicken off to turn in. Um, so I think there's, there's value in opposing him on reasonable ground. But I think if it is soft, he'd be hard to beat. Okay, before we go any further, just because you mentioned Willie's good record in this race, both of you, fastest, uh, quickest buzzer answer first, please. <laughs> How many times has Willie Mullins won the Supreme Hurdle? Guess seven. You're wrong, Six. Barry. Well done, Tony, okay. for God's sake. <laughs> and then the second follow up <laughs> the, se the, the second follow-up question to this then, and Tony, now of course you're the odds on shot to get this right. Who is ahead of him in terms of a trainer who's won the Supreme the most times and how many times did that person win the Supreme? Oh Nicky Henderson, isn't it? I don't oh, know. You're absolutely both no. Barry Barry, give me yeah, the right answer. I'm still here, I'm still here. Yeah, have you got anything for me on that? Have you got the correct answer? 
Paul Nichols, no? No. Vincent O'Brien won oh, the Supreme yeah. ten oh, times. Yeah, show, yeah, showing ten your age, times. I know, I'm a 90s baby, Barry Garrity, born in the 90s. Uh, Vincent won it 10 times. When I saw that, I thought, how is that even possible? But anyway, there you go. Just some trivial information for you. Tony, what's your view on the Supreme, please? Uh, just want to raise something that I've been thinking about and appreciated for a while. Um, look, <laughs> I've kind of been against them. It seems to be a lot of people in the maybe the racing media, the tipsters and all that, are, are against them, uh, which is fine, of course. Um, but I just want to raise something. That I'm sort of interested in how the markets go and all this type of stuff. It's, it's, it's nerdy stuff on one level, but I suppose the most important information, of market information we have about appreciated at the moment is the fact that the Dublin Racing Festival, I think he was put in uh, four to five initially and he went off one to three. So despite all the so-called judges, and I'm including myself in that, uh, thinking that maybe he was a bad price there, someone um, with a lot more money than me and probably a lot more sense uh, thought, he, thought he was a brilliant price at four to five and everything down to one to three. And I would get the suspicion that a lot of the, the maybe the, the people writing about it would be saying, oh, this lad's a bad favourite, this lad's a bad favourite, and he would be absolutely smashed. Um, there's examples like this every year at the festival. Um, I think Barry's actually been involved with a couple of them. Carefully Selected was one last year. Everyone was, say, uh, everyone was saying Carefully Selected, or he can't jump. Um, he's a rotten price at 2-1 to one for the, the National Chase. I think he went off odds on. They were right about it. People were, probably were right about that. But one that I remember Barry been involved was, and this is another one that lost, I'll pick one that won in a minute, Apple Shakira. Everyone's saying she was an absolutely awful price in the run up to the meeting. I don't know what she was, five to four or like that. I think she was absolutely smashed. She could have went off six to four. I think she was one of the biggest. I know she didn't win, but it's just that the people would say that the price was awful. Well, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. I think Appetant was a little bit like that last year. Everyone was trying to get her beat. Um, and she was just the best horse, you know. So it's just, just something interesting to think about that not to be getting a big head in yourself. You're, you, you're, you're writing a little bit of your tipping a horse here or there. Like there's, there's far more clever people are betting a lot more money that are going to influence the markets far more. But anyway, I'm still going to go against Appreciated despite all that. Um, <laughs> after after that, that big day of time about him, um, the horse that I, I have put up during the week and I'm a little bit disappointed his form didn't work out at the weekend is the Devil's Coachman. He is 19 or 20 lengths now to get back and appreciate it from Christmas. but He's two years younger horse. Um, thought things didn't really go his way at Christmas. He didn't jump well. He had, he didn't he wouldn't have the bumper background that um, appreciated had. He'd one run in, in a four year old bumper. Appreciate would have had four runs and went to Cheltenham's and Dublin Racing Festivals and all that type of stuff. But a small what he did at Navin on his penultimate run, a really excellent performance um, time wise, given weight away and just just to stride a couple of would look half decent horses. And then he's gone on at one one at Punchestown, won well in a really slowly run race. He never really looked in danger. I suppose people malign Noel Mead a little bit for Cheltenham Festival record, but um, like I think he, I think he's only one of three trainers that have actually won all the three novice hurdles um, at the meeting. Uh, I think Willie Mullins and Nicky Henderson are the other two, um, so that, that's a pretty decent record. I think if he is, that does seem to be his, his better type of race at Cheltenham. I just thought whatever he is there, I think he's still 14, 16 to 1. I, I think he, he has a, a chance of making the frame anyway, and there is a little bit of improvement in him yet. Like it. Currently 16 to 1 with Bet365 for the Supreme Hurdle, the Devil's Coachman. One to put in everyone's notebook, please. Uh, viewers, who do you like for the Supreme? Are you taking on Appreciate It? Let us know. Let's move on to the Ballymore. Uh, another Willie Mullins favourite, this time obviously not quite as short, in Gaylad de Mesnil. Currently 11 to 4 with Bet365. Bob Ollinger is 4 to 1. And Tony, I wanted to come to you first because... I do this sometimes and I commit and say that you're a fan of a horse and now I'm thinking maybe I got this wrong but you are a Bob Ollinger fan aren't you? Yeah I've gone back and forth a little bit on him I think I've mentioned him before he's the one I've actually backed him for this race um, right. two or three weeks ago just I, I do think it's a, a three cornered affair and, and all three of those front ones could be going off a little bit shorter because there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of depth in it um, he won well in this the form looks pretty solid Um Blue Lord beating around the same distance be appreciated. Like who's the only horse that beaten him to date? Fernie Hollow. Um, you know, that's pretty good. I think him getting an extra run in the maiden hurdle was good for Bob Ollinger. It uh, tightened up his jumping a bit. Um, and that's it's never the worst thing to have an extra run in the maiden hurdle or, or in a maiden generally, um, if it kinda helps your progression. The fact with him that he only had the one bumper start. And Nace, Nace was very good. Um I think with Gayard the Mini, I just wonder will he really have the pace pace for he did win over two six on pretty testing ground at Dublin Racing Festival. I suppose the trip was a worry with him going into it. I just think at the prices I would prefer Henry de Bromwich. Paul Nichols' horse has has been very impressive um 
form of the last run wouldn't really have worked out, but he's hard to knock. And I suppose the, the, the trainer comparing him to Denman is a bit of a sign. But you would expect it to, to be those trainers. I just marginally favour Bob Ollinger. Okay, well, Brave Bang's game is currently 4 to 1, the same price as Bob Ollinger. Both of those two are 4 to 1, and then Gaylord de Manil is 11 to 4 with bet 365. Barry, are you falling with the Paul Nichols horse or with the horse at, all, at a bigger price, or are you sticking with the home team? No, I'd, I'd be with Tony. I like Bob Ollinger. Um, I don't think he's a standout. I don't think he's a standout, though. Um, Gaylord de Manil, um, he, he worked on the, on the soft heavy ground. Paul rode him to challenge. Um, and it was 2-6 on soft to heavy ground I just wonder if he's going to have the pace as well for the race um, it'll be interesting to see and the fact that he's going for this rather than the Albert Bartlett for me on that he looked more like an Al a standard in the Albert Bartlett um, but a horse that does interest me and he'll probably go for the Supreme but uh, it ties in with the Bob Ollinger form is Blue Lord I'd love to see him run over this trip drop him in somewhere halfway get him relaxed um, I think he'd run a big race but um, I'd say he'd probably go for the two mile but I think this one would suit him and um, would, would you want to keep him on side at all in the Supreme Blue Lord or uh, only if you saw him over two and a half? Only over the trip because he didn't have the pace to come from, from off the pace in Leperstown last time um, where I think he would have the pace over two and a half to come from, from midway or somewhere like that. But he's, 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 it was a great run in this behind Bob Ollinger and for me he was the horse to take out of it. So um, I would have him over Bob Ollinger if he lined up here. Interesting. Blue Lord currently 20 to 1 with bet 365 if he lines up in the Ballymore. Again, viewers, get involved. Tell us who you're backing for the Ballymore, please. Let's move on to the Albert Bartlett, which is a way more open affair. Um, very tricky, I think, to dissect at this point. You've got Statler, who's the 6 to 1 favourite. Bakura's 6 to 1. And Barbados Bucks, who I'm a big fan of, is 10 to 1 at the moment from the Paul Nichols Yard, a horse who is going to have to step up significantly on what we've seen so far. But he's just got a nice progressive profile. And in a wide open race, uh, he was one that I fell at at a slightly bigger price currently, 10 to 1 with bet 365. Barry, where did you fall with the Albert Bartlett? And I mean, is it. Is it just me or is it a bizarrely weak affair at this point this year or is it often like this actually? It can be like this. Um, it was a strong race last year obviously um, but no, this year they do what not excite you. Statler I think is very beatable for Kira likewise. I came down with Tory Graf looks like an improver. He won nicely in Torless last time. I think he stays well. He is by Mahler out of a presenting mare so there's lots of stamina in his pedigree and you're going to need that because this is three mile on the new course and it's it's generally a war. So it's going to be a tough race. I thought he was one but it's wide open. I think you could you could make a case for some at, at long odds who'd have a chance. You could probably figure out a little bit of each way of value but for me I thought he was the one um, to oppose the top two in the market. Okay, taking on the top two. Tony, uh, did you find anything at bigger odds that's a bit of value? Yeah, I would kind of agree with Barry here. It looks so much weaker race than last year. Like You would have had um, latest exhibition coming into it for grade one win. Uh, Time Hill the same. Monkfish looking a real good potential horse. Fury Road, nothing really of that level seems to be this year. So it wouldn't be the great surprise if something came, an unexposed horse or something that hasn't shown its hand to improve past the... The seemingly standard setters, which aren't really setting the bar that high. Toriograph to me, Taurus was a bit of a mess of a race. He kind of got it done. Um, his previous form at Ferry House reads really well. We'll see here now. He beat Velvet Elvis 13 lengths, giving him eight pounds. Velvet Elvis came out and won his two starts since he's now rated 132. That looks a nice bit of form. He probably, well, he's unproven on, on better ground, but he looks to have taken well to hurdles, taken well to stay in trip. So, would have a chance, although I, actually I don't. I don't think there's an awful lot of juice in his price now. I think he's as sharp as he at the one. I think he may be generally at the one now. So, uh, yeah, he maybe a few weeks ago he was fine, but he is a bit skinny looking now. But that it speaks to the race. Indeed, definitely the Albert Bartlett, uh, the weaker of the three uh, novice hurdle contests. But looking forward to it all the same. Uh, cannot wait. But viewers. Again, let us know who you're backing. Do you like the fact that Tony and Barry agree with Bob Ollinger in the Ballymore? Are you taking on Appreciate It? And at the bigger prices, who do you like in the Albert Bartlett? Get involved, please, in the comments section on YouTube. And whilst you're there, hit subscribe. You know the drill. Uh, it's nearly time to wrap up the show. But before we do, Tony, I know you had a question for Barry just in terms of funny time of year. Only two weeks to go before the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, even stranger this year for... 
various reasons, but uh, handing the microphone over to you, please, now. Yes, just a question for Barry as regards jockeys, I suppose, this thing, idea of minding themselves at this time of year, like, like, is that possible? You know, no jockey wants to maybe pick up a ban or, or even work, pick up an injury. Um, like, can you even do that, Barry? Is it a pick and choose in your raids? Do you, not really, I don't know if there's anything you can do style-wise. Like, how would you have approached this fortnight in, in the week or two before? I suppose the races aren't anywhere near as prestigious as what's going to be coming up and you do want to be looking ahead. Oh, definitely. It's something that would be on your mind, um, especially a ban. So for the last week, at this stage, um, you, have a, you have two weeks from um, the time that you pick up the ban, so the actual ban being imposed. So you'd be sitting quiet from all of this week anyway and making sure your stick is down and you're keeping a straight line and everything. So that's very important. Um, as regards picking your rides, you, you know, you dodge the bullets. You just ride, ride which you could justify riding that you wouldn't, you know, if you're going to fall off something and you miss chatting, you'd say, what was I doing riding this thing? You wouldn't want to put yourself in that position. So try and be selective, but you can't affect, you can't change your riding style because if you approach a fence or hurdle any differently, it usually has a bad effect. So just ride as normal. You put Cheltenham. I always treated Cheltenham as if it was months away until the Sunday night before the festival. And at that stage, your next ride was in Cheltenham. So it's it's very difficult. The more you try, the harder it is to keep yourself safe. But um, just try and dodge the bullets. Be sensible not to ride a, a dodgy jumper. And um, yeah, but you can't do much with your riding only. Maybe try not to get a ban. Like it, dodging bullets necessary at this time of year. Uh, last but not least, boys, it's tracker time. Uh, Tony Keenan, who's your tracker horse this week, please? Um, Rhythm Devine, she won the handicap hurdle at Fairy House on Saturday. She was off a break and uh, to the ground was a little bit slow for her. Um, she's got a little bit of shuffling, I think, just prior to the to the to the fourth last, but um, you know, made up her ground quite well into the straight and finished off strongly. I think the form of this is quite good. She was five lengths clear of ten ten, who to me would look on a mark that he can win off his nice. I know he's had a couple of disappointing runs in the in the Paddy Power and the Tiestis, um, but his previous hurdle run at Nice would make him look well handicapped. And then he had another she had another eight lengths back to the um. The tour, Matty's Mountain, who'd won his last three, so form looks pretty solid. She's gone up nine pounds, that might be fair. Um, and she's won a uh, major, uh, I suppose, thing in her lockers that she would actually probably be better than a bit of nice ground. So coming into the spring, the, the faster ground will probably actually suit her. So to me, it was a much improved performance and hopefully she'll be able to go on from this. Okay, in the track as she goes. Thank you very much, Tony. And Barry, you need a winner, I'm afraid, because you're bottom of the table, I do. pal. I do. I know, and I'm a close third though, Vanessa. Um, I, I thought Stanley Pincombe uh, was third in the bumper and Kempton ran a cracker. It was a good competitive field. Um, she dropped in towards the rear to settle. She was a little keen early, but travelled really well through the race and showed good pace to come from off the pace. Um, she also was only a four-year-old taking on older horses. So um, I thought it was a good run, and with the experience, I'd like to think she might settle a little bit closer, but she has the pace to come from, from back there. So it's a... Uh, it was a good run. I'd say she's won gold places. Okay, two mares for you two. Uh, Calico for me, second in the Dove Cup. Pretty obvious one, I'm afraid, but for Dan and Harry Skelton, only having a second start for them, having come off the flat from Europe and just the horse who I was surprised that he was in there. Um, and then, yeah, the way in which he travelled through the race was pretty impressive and a few excuses for why he didn't win, but definitely want to keep on side Calico for me. Uh, I think that pretty much rounds off proceedings. Thank you very much for watching, as always. Only two weeks to go before the Cheltenham Festival. We are very much on the countdown here on the Off The Fence show. And as always, uh, keep, keep your comments coming. Give us a retweet, give us a like, get involved. We read them all and we really appreciate your feedback. That was Off The Fence, brought to you in association with Bet365.